Timidandasya Gyananjana Chalakaya Chakshurum Bibitam Jena Tasmai Sri Gudabe Namaha Sri Chaitanya Masno Mistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Sri Guru Sri Juta Patakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavamscha Sri Rupam Sagrajataham Sahagana Raghunatham Bidam Tham Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padahan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vidhamscha E Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinabandhu Chakatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindabhaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vansha Kalpatarubhyascha Kripasindubhya Evacha Patithanam Bhavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasati Gaura Bhakta Binda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tinamini Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudapani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Bhastyatyate Shadhani Hare Krishna I'm so grateful to be here with you today. Every year on this holy day of Govardhan Puja Diwali, we are on a yatra in a distant holy place of pilgrimage celebrating. And each year we're always thinking of how we would love to be here at Radha Gopinath Temple. Now we're at Radha Gopinath Temple thinking how we would like to be in a place of pilgrimage. <laughs> That's the nature of this world. But actually, there's no place in Brahma's creation I would rather be on this holy day than here with you. Thank you for being with us. And I don't know if you could see, but on the other side of this partition, it looks like all the Brijabhasis performing Parikrama of Govardhan. <laughs> Please stand up for a moment to see. <laughs> uh, 
and interesting leading the way is Giri Govardhan Prabhu, <laughs> son of Mahaprabhu, Palika Devi. Hare Krishna. Now you can be seated. And if possible, you can be quiet also. <laughs> the month of Kartik is presided by Srimati Radharani, who is the ultimate personification and the origin of Prem, or ecstatic love. It is from her heart that all bhakti in all spiritual and material worlds is emanating. All the love of God that is potential within every living being throughout existence is part and parcel or expansions of Sri Radha's love for Krishna. As the Fladini Shakti, pleasure potency, she is none different than Krishna. Radha Bhava Duti Subalita Nomi Krishna Swarupam. Radha Krishna Pranaya Vikratir Hadini Shakti Rasmat. The absolute truth is one, but they are eternally manifesting two forms, two personalities. The one God is forever two, Radha Gopinath. And they expand in many forms, Sitaram, Lakshmi Narayan, Bhuvaraha, and limitless others for the purpose of exchanging love. This is not the love that we understand in material world. The love of this world is a reflection of the true love, of the soul for God and God's love for the soul, which has its supreme origin in the love between Radha and Gopinath. Sri Radha is making limitless arrangements for Krishna's pleasure. The greatest pleasure of Krishna is he is Rasa Vihari. He feels intimately for each and every living being. Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam Hridesya Janatishtiti. He expands himself to live in the heart of every living being besides the soul. Wherever there's life, there's the Jivatma, the child of God, and the Paramatma, God himself. Is there any conception of such love in this world? Birth after birth after birth, from within and without, Krishna never leaves us. He's always waiting for us. Paritra naya sadhunam vinashaya chaduskritam. 
He appears within this world again and again. The origin of all the true religions of the world throughout history, throughout all the planets, just to remind us of the treasure we've forgotten, to recognize and appreciate his love for us, and to naturally reciprocate with our love. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is Krishna, with the mood of love and the compassion of Sri Radha. He has said that any single devotee who surrenders their heart with love for me, I consider that person more valuable than all the wealth in all the universes, in all of creation. This is God's standard. We are eager for property. We're eager for jewelry. entire creation. Mamai Vamsa Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. We are all little parts of Krishna. Qualitatively, we are one with Krishna. We are Satchit Ananda, eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. Nityo nityanam chaitanus chaitananam eko bahunam yogadadati kamam. But like the sun, he is the source of all sun rays, and we are like those sun rays. Qualitatively of the same substance as him, but always subordinate. Jivera swarupoy krishnera nityadas. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained from the basic principles of philosophy to the deepest rasa to Sanatan Goswami. And he built this elaborate teachings on a single foundation that we are all eternally the servants of Krishna, of God. And there's only one service that pleases Krishna. Samsidhyar Haditoshana. He is Bhava Grahi Janardana. He doesn't need our intelligence, nor our abilities, nor the influences we have on others. What to speak of our wealth? He only wants our love. And although we are little tiny pieces of Krishna, any one of us, Krishna agrees to be conquered by that love. And that happens when we become conquered by Krishna's love. Srila Prabhupada explains that the whole purpose of the path of bhakti and the highest purpose of human life is to become attracted by Krishna. And Krishna is all attractive. Simply by hearing about him, by chanting his name, by serving him, by associating with those who love him, 
or are striving to love him, that attraction awakens naturally. So Sri Radha was eternally, infinitely eager to give Krishna happiness. She knows in this cosmic manifestation, the material world, the greatest happiness Krishna has is when us, each of us, personally, individually, when we open our hearts to receive his love and serve him with love. The month of Kartik is a time when Sri Radha especially freely gives the opportunity to make progress in the path of devotional service. During this month, there are festivals. And each of these festivals reveals to us particular rasas of Vrindavan. Specifically, how Krishna is conquered by the love of the devotee and how the devotees are conquered by the love of Krishna. The month of Kartik begins with the ultimate manifestation of divine love, Sarat Purnima. Where Krishna goes to Bamsivat, a beautiful banyan tree on the bank of the Yamuna River in Sri Vrindavan town, and plays Bamsi, a small flute. The love of his heart comes through his lips in the form of his breath. And it flows through that flute in the form of the origin and the sweetest of all music. flows through the air and tears into the ears of the gopis, the simple cowherd girls of Braja, village girls. And when it enters their heart, they abandon all their duties. They abandon all causes of fear or social chastisement. They simply want to go to give happiness to Krishna. And it is there on the bank of the Yamuna that they meet Lord Krishna and have the Rasa Leela, an endless dance of the highest perfection of pure spiritual love. And it is there that Sri Krishna, he leaves all other gopis to accept the service of Sri Radha. And there in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Shukadeva Goswami establishes. She is the topmost of devotees. Srila Prabhupada explains when we're the servant of the servant of the servant and live in a mood of compassion toward others for God's pleasure, then Sri Radha will take that devotee, whoever we are, whatever our nationality, whatever our race, whatever our sex, whatever our social background, these are all temporary material things. The soul is eternal. The soul is transcendental. She brings that devotee to Krishna. And this is what she'll do for each and every one of us if we just let her. And she'll say, Krishna, this devotee is better than me. Please accept her or him. 
and because of the power of her love, Krishna must accept. Sri Radharani is the ultimate fountainhead of all divine love. She is God. She is the absolute truth. And she's thinking that any devotee who sincerely serves is better than her. So what is our position? To think ourselves better than anyone. It means we really don't understand. The greatest impediment to pure devotion is ahankar, the false ego. We want to be the enjoyer. The enjoyer means of sensual pleasures and also of mental, egoistic pleasures, fame, prestige. We want to be the proprietor. We want to be the controller. But when the demigods look down at us, they think how insignificant. We're proud of what we can control, of what we can enjoy. It lasts for a few years and then it's taken away. But in the spiritual world, they don't even, they don't follow, they don't give any significance to the demigods controlling. Because the spiritual world is where we give up this desire to be the enjoyer, the proprietor, and the controller. We appreciate the devotion of others. And therefore we want to be the servant of servant of servant. Kartik begins with the Rasa Lila of Shri Radha Govinda and the gopis in Madhurya Ras. Then there is the appearance day of Radha Kund, Bahulastami, when the most the most vicious demon, Aristasura, who comes to destroy the residence of Vrindavan comes to kill Krishna and Balaram and all the bridge bhasis. From his hoofprint, the holiest of all holy places is manifest, Shamakund and Radhakund. When Lord Chaitanya was looking for Radhakund, Shamakund, he knew it was in the village of Aritagram, named after Aristasura. As we know, Radha Kund and Shama Kund are the supremely most holy places in all of Brahma's creation. Because it is there where the most confidential pastimes of love between gopis and Krishna are performed eternally. And yet they're manifest to the world through the hoof print of a murderous, evil Asura demon. So we can speak about the Rasik pastimes that take place on the banks of Radha Kund and within the waters of Radha Kund. But first we should understand that even calamities and setbacks and crises that come in life they actually can be uh, the basis for bhakti to grow. Devotees see every situation as an opportunity to serve. The hoofprint of a demon was made into a holy kund. And similarly, when people are not nice to us, 
adhyatmaka, adhidaivaka, adhibhautaka, miseries caused by other people, other living beings, by our own health, physically or mentally, or by circumstances like too much rain or not enough rain, earthquakes, heat, cold. whatever it may be, devotees look for the opportunity to grow in their bhakti through that situation. Ahoyta ki apratihata. Real bhakti is when we are not motivated by egoism or selfishness. And we simply want to continue our service our hearing and our chanting in a positive mood, not in a complaining mood, in a positive mood, even in difficult situations. Radha Kund and Shama Kund manifested in the month of Kartik and are still just near Govardhan Hill in Sri Brajbhumi. Narottam Das Thakur, his disappearance day. Vira Chandra, the son of Nityananda Prabhu, was born in Kartik. And today, the day of Diwali, is a day of Krishna's pastime with his mother Yashoda how he is conquered by her love. On the day of Diwali in Ayodhya, after Ram, with the help of Hanuman and Lakshman and Sugriva, Jambavan, they conquered Ravana, rescued Sita, and after 14 years of exile, they returned to their kingdom people of Ayodhya for those 14 years, every breath, every heartbeat, was an intense yearning to be reunited with Ram, everyone there. For 14 years, the people of Ayodhya, they couldn't speak anything except discussions of Ram. Their eyes were constantly looking to see when will Ram come. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Yugayatam Nimeshena Chakshusha Prabhratayatam, Sunyayatam Jagat Sarvam Govinda Virahename. A moment is like 12 years or more. That's how it's translated so we can get some conception. But the actual verse says a moment seems like a yuga. Satya yuga is millions of years. And that's not just a poetic expression. That's what, when we, when we love Krishna, that's what a moment is like. The gopis of Vrindavan, they chastise Lord Brahma. They're village girls. To chastise Lord Brahma? How many of you have chastised Lord Brahma? <laughs> this is the nature of their love. Their chastisement is, why is he such an imperfect creator? He put these eyelids because this nimesh, this amount of time of an involuntary blink where the lower eyelid touches the upper eyelid, it's about one twelfth of a second. You're all blinking, but you don't even know you're blinking. But the gopis are saying, it's like a yuga. It's like millions of years 
bereft of the sight of Govinda. That love and separation, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught us, is the highest happiness. Because we're never separated from Krishna. Krishna is non different than his name. Krishna is non different than the thought of Krishna. Krishna is perfectly present when we're serving Krishna. Krishna is in the form of the Archer Murti. It's just a matter of recognizing it, which only comes when Krishna reveals himself. Brahma Samhita explains uh, when our eyes are de decorated with the ointment of love, then we actually see Krishna. And especially we see him in separation from him. Those feelings of separation deep in the core of the heart, the devotee is feeling Krishna's presence, being embraced by Krishna and embracing Krishna. So the residents of Ayodhya, in a similar way, they are waiting each moment when will Ram come? And on the day of Diwali, Ram comes. And they light up with little lamps, the lamp of their love, the lamp of their gratitude, the lamp of their willingness to serve. That is Diwali. It is that love that dispels all the darkness of ignorance forever. It is that light that brings us into the realm of truth beyond death. So, since that time, Diwali is a very beautiful festival of light. It's considered the new year when the Lord returns. And in Vrindavan on this day, Yashoda Mai, she decided to personally rise early in the morning to make a special offering a fresh sweet butter for Lord Gopal, who was just a little child. Nanda Maharaj had 900,000 cows. And there were seven or eight of those cows, which were the most special, because they were fed the most fragrant, delicious grasses that Yashoda Mai would grow herself. This is how she loved Gopal. She would go out and grow grass. And this grass had the fragrance and the texture of lotus flowers. Not the kind of lotus flowers we see, but the lotus flowers of the spiritual world. And the cows would eat that grass, and it was so nice, it was so soft, it was so sweet, it was so fragrant, it was so nutritious. And you showed him I, after milking those cows, she took that special milk to, and made it into yogurt, dahi, with her own hands the day before. And on Diwali morning, she rose early to churn it, to churn it into butter. She was thinking that there's so many complaints that the elder gopis lodge against Krishna and Balaram. 
that he goes to their houses and performs so many mischievous pastimes and steals their yogurt, their butter, their milk, their ghee. And those gopis, when Yashoda Mai would threaten that I will somehow keep Krishna home, they would say, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> they would simply make their ghee. They would simply milk their cows, make their butter, their dahi, only with the hope that Krishna will come to steal it. When our hearts become soft and sweet like that butter, then Krishna will steal our hearts. His name is Hari. So Yashoda Mai wanted to make such nice butter that Krishna would be so satisfied that he wouldn't have to go to other people's homes to steal. She was churning. Shukadeva Goswami describes it so beautifully. Her sari was a saffron yellow color. Her hair was decorated with malati flowers. She had bracelets on her wrists. And as she was churning, the bracelets were jingling and making beautiful music. And she was singing songs, song about Krishna's pastimes. That is Vrindavan. Whenever Krishna would come home from herding the calves, at this time he didn't even start herding the calves. He was really young. But whatever he would do, at every moment, what, anything was so beautiful, it was so attractive, it was so intoxicating to the, to the heart and the soul, that the Prajbasis would write songs about it. If a breeze would move a single one of Krishna's hairs, that would be such a wonderful experience. They would write songs about it. Everything Krishna did was worthy of beautiful masterpiece of music. They would sing. So Yashoda was singing these songs. And what is the purpose of these songs? When we sing them, we remember Krishna. It's an absorption. Bhakti is about being absorbed. Absorbed in hearing, absorbed in chanting, absorbed in praying, absorbed in serving. When we really want to please someone, we become absorbed in what we do for them. It's, in Krishna consciousness, nothing is an empty ritual. Everything is a deep absorbing offering of devotion. So as she was singing the songs and the music of her bangles were accompanying her, and the sound of the churning of the, the yogurt was also keeping beautiful melody. It was like a little orchestra. She was so absorbed in remembering Krishna that milk began to flow from her breast. And Krishna, who is sleeping, is really never sleeping. He became hungry for that milk because the milk is her love. The milk is not just some material liquid. It's the manifestation of her love. Krishna's hungry for the love of his devotee. So he came to that spot and he came before Yashoda, just little Gopal, and held the churning rod and looked at his mother that right now I am the priority. 
So he, he crawled upon her lap and she placed him very gently and began feeding Gopal the milk of her love. As she was doing, she was looking at Krishna's face, the ultimate perfection of all beauty, the source of all beauty, the infinite ever expanding beautiful face of Krishna, who was so happy, tasting her praying. Suddenly, in the next room, she was boiling milk from those special cows. It was boiling over. She could hear it. It was going into the fire. It is said that the milk was thinking, what is the use of my existence? I cannot compare to Yashoda's milk. Krishna will never give up that milk for me. So I entered into fire. Yashoda Mai, that milk was, she was going to make so many wonderful, wonderful preparations for Krishna with that milk. It was only for his pleasure. So for Krishna's service, she put Krishna down and ran to take the milk off the fire. But Krishna wanted to perform a pastime that would forever be celebrated within the hearts of his every devotee. So he took the opportunity where he became very angry. How is it possible? That anger is not our anger. Our anger is frustrated material desires. Krishna's anger is only to increase the praying and the attraction within the hearts of his devotees. So he took a stone He did it quite quietly so Yashodamai wouldn't hear it, but it was hard enough to break the pot of yogurt, which was just becoming butter, and it spilled on the floor. And Krishna went into the next room and he saw that the previous day Yashodamai personally churned some butter out of yogurt. And it was on a rafter hanging from ropes and he brought that and he brought it to a wooden grinding mortar and sat on the grinding mortar to eat it. Meanwhile, Yashoda Mai, after she put the pot down off the stove, she came and she saw Krishna wasn't there. There was a broken pot. There was butter all over the floor. And she immediately understood that this is my Gopal. And she saw little butter footprints. And she traced them, followed them. She picked up a small stick because she wanted to teach Krishna a lesson. He's not supposed to be breaking things in the house. She went into another part of the house of Nanda Maharaj and there she saw Gopal sitting on the grind, on an upside down grinding mortar that was used to grind spices and he was feeding butter to the monkeys of Prindaban. <laughs> they were very happy. The monkeys were taking the butter right from Krishna's hand and their hand and they were eating and taking more and taking more and Krishna was feeding them and he was eating it himself and feeding the monkeys. It was a very beautiful scene. Yashodamai saw that. She also saw that the whole time Krishna was eating butter and feeding monkeys butter, he was looking from side to side in fear of his mother. 
you showed him I smiled. It was just so beautiful, the sweetest of all sweet. Krishna looking around so nervous. Very quietly from behind, she walked toward Gopal. And suddenly Krishna saw her, and the monkeys, they started screeching. <laughs> Yashoda Mai tried to catch Krishna. But Krishna, as soon as he saw his mother with a little stick, he jumped off the grinding mortar to run away. He was running. She was running after him. It is explained by Shukadev Goswami that Krishna He's faster than the speed of wind. He's faster than the speed of mind. Even the greatest of yogis and jnanis, no one could catch Krishna. Yashoda Mai was running and running. But Krishna allowed himself to be caught by his mother. Krishna is conquered by the love of his mother, Batsalya Ras. He started to cry. Tears were pouring from his beautiful lotus-like eyes. They were mixing with the black mascara that was put around them. And the tears were becoming dark color, and they were streaking his beautiful body. His limbs were trembling. His lips were quivering. And he told his mother, please, I admit that I have stole the butter. Please put down that stick. Don't punish me. Queen Kunti, she has explained in Srimad Bhagavatam this scene that Krishna is feared by fear personified. In Bhagavat, but yet he's afraid of his mother. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, I am death personified. In the 11th chapter, he manifests just a partial expansion of an expansion of his an expansion as Virat Rupa, the universal form. Arjuna was the greatest, most powerful, fearless warrior on the planet. And he was trembling in fear when he saw Virat Rupa. He told Krishna, please take this form away. I just want to see you as Krishna again. Gopal is the source of Virat Rupa. One of his expansions is Varaha, Narasimha. Even Lakshmi was frightened of Narasimha. What to speak of Indra and Brahma and Shiva? Such a fearful form. But yet the almighty, supreme, absolute truth, the source of all other avatars, the avatari, Krishna, is actually feeling fear of his mother, and he's trembling, and he's crying. And he's begging, pleading, I did it, I did it, please forgive me. Yashoda Mai seeing him, she threw the stick away. It was only to show him. He said, Krishna, you are, because you associate with monkeys, you have become like a monkey. 
running, stealing, to protect him. She had so many duties to perform for his seva. She told Krishna, I'm going to tie you up. She had a beautiful silken rope that was used to tie the calves when they were too naughty. When she put the rope around his waist, it was the width of two fingers too short. She bought more rope and tied it to the original rope. It was exactly the width of two fingers too short. She tied more and more and more rope to all of that rope, and it was still exactly two fingers width too short. Soon other gopis started coming, and they were seeing this incredible festival of ropes. <laughs> they started bringing all their ropes from their houses, and there were mountains of ropes and all the gopis were watching in total astonishment. There was over 150 feet of ropes tied together. And it was still the width of two fingers too short. The gopis were telling Yashoda Mai that don't, do not you see it is not Krishna's destiny to be tied today. You'll never tie him up. But she was endeavoring so much. She told her friends that I must see how many ropes it takes to bind the waist of my child. It was incredibly awakening, the intensity of her love, because she's not thinking Krishna as God. She's thinking Krishna as her child. And yet the rope is 100 meters long. And yet his waist is, ex she said, his waist is only the size of my fist. And it's not growing bigger. How is it all this rope does not go around his little waist? Just previous to this pastime, Krishna showed the universal form to, he, he showed the whole universe within his own mouth to his mother at Brahmandagat when he ate dirt and she looked inside, he showed the universe and his mouth didn't get any bigger. This is Gopal. But she forgot all about it by the Yogamaya potency. And now she kept tying more and more and more rope. But how is it possible to put a rope around Krishna? The Upanishads describe that the absolute truth, Krishna, has no beginning and no end, no inside and no outside. It's beyond past, present, and future. He's ananta, unlimited. He showed him my inner efforts. The malati flowers were falling from her hair. She was perspiring. Her sari was becoming loosened. Krishna, overcome by his mother's love, allowed himself to be bound around his waist. His name, Damodar one who was bound 
around the waist by the love of his mother. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains what is it that compensated that width of two fingers that always made her efforts too short? What is it required to actually bind Krishna by our love? He explains two principles. One is the devotee's efforts with determination and with faith to give all they have for the loving service of Krishna. And despite all obstacles, to never give up. Ahaitikiyapratihata Bhakta Nishta When we really try our best and beyond, and however many impediments, we just never give up because we have faith. We have faith in the Supreme Lord's mercy. That type of devotion, that service attitude attracts Krishna. And when Krishna is attracted by our sincere efforts, then Kripa, he bestows his mercy. And these are the two principles that bind Krishna the sincere efforts of the devotee and the mercy of the Lord. When Krishna was bound, Yashodamai tied him to the wooden grinding mortar and went to perform her duties. And when she was gone, Krishna looked into the courtyard and saw the Yamala Arjuna two trees and they were gigantic trees. They were there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years, gigantic trees with deep roots towering into the sky, standing right next to each other. And Krishna recognized them. They were cursed by Narada Muni. In previous life, they were Nala Kuvera and Mani Griva, the sons of Kuvera. They were devas, demigods. Because of their physical beauty, their wealth, their strength, their knowledge, they were proud. And when Narada Muni came walking by, they were bathing with ladies with no clothes on, heavenly ladies. And the heavenly ladies jumped out of the water because they were embarrassed to be in that state by in, in the front of a great sage. Nala Kuvera Manigriva didn't care anything. Because they were proud. What is the greatest danger of arrogance? That we don't respect others. Amani namana dena. A devotee is one who offers all respect to others. But when we're blinded by arrogance, we don't see the good qualities in others. We're just thinking about ourselves all the time. and we make offenses. So Narada Muni, out of his causeless mercy, he cursed them to be trees. But they weren't like most trees, because Mani Griva and Nala Kuvera had the full consciousness of demigods, but they were trapped in these bodies as trees and they couldn't even move. But after a long, long time, 
by Narada Muni's grace, Krishna performed his pastimes and they happened to be right in Nanda Maharaja's courtyard. So they were seeing Krishna perform all these leelas. Krishna crawled between the trees. The grinding mortar got stuck. And <laughs> the trees fell to the ground, echoing, not like me. <laughs> it's like an earthquake. Krishna was smiling, he's just crawling. And from the trees came the forms of Madhigriva and Nalakuvera and their demigod Swaroops. And they offered prayers. And the essence of their prayers is they were so grateful to Narada Muni that through the pain of what they went through, the ordeal, they learned a good lesson and they became actually humble. And when they be actually became humbled completely and they became truly grateful to their guru's mercy, then they got to see Krishna. And they became completely purified. They surrendered to Krishna. They had nothing but gratitude and affection. And they realized how whoever we are to have high position, to have power, and to have influence. It's potentially very dangerous. They were truly humbled. And Krishna accepted their lives. They became his eternal associates. Completely purified and Krishna sent them back to their heavenly abodes. Meanwhile, the bridge bossies, when they heard these trees falling, they came running. Yashoda Maya was so disturbed. She was thinking, because of me, Krishna was almost killed by these trees. Nanda Maharaj came running. The cowherd boys were there first. But they tried to untie Krishna, but they couldn't untie him from the grinding mortar. He was just smiling and joking with them. And then Nanda Maharaj came and Krishna started crying. <laughs> like he was afraid that these trees just fell on both sides of me. I was just minding my own business. Mother Yashoda, she bound me up and now look what happened because she did that. And he was crying and Nanda Maharaj's heart was so broken and sympathetic and then when Nanda Maharaj would turn his head away Krishna would look at the gopas his little friends and he would laugh and smile and <laughs> say look at, look at me. <laughs> Nanda Maharaj untied Krishna with the love because it was tied with the Vatsalya love of Sri Yashodamai it was untied but the, by the fatherly love of Nanda Maharaj. And Yashoda Mai was thinking, Krishna must be so angry with me. Nanda Maharaj said, what happened? The little boys told Nanda Maharaj that Krishna pulled it and the trees fell down. The, gop the elderly gopas said, this is impossible. How could we listen to the, little, the words of these children? Krishna said, Mother, Mataji tied me up. Look what happened. Nanda Maharaj said, well, shall I take you back to your mother? Rohini Devi came and said, Yashoda Mai is waiting for you. Please come. And Krishna said, I don't want to see my mother. I will stay with my father. <laughs> now for you or me, it wouldn't affect us too much. But for Yashoda Mai, that was worse than death. Krishna's un displeased with me. Look at what I have done. I made him so scared. I put him in such a predicament. He doesn't even want to be with me. 
He was on the ver she was practically on the verge of giving up her life. She was feeling so distressed by tying up Krishna. And when Krishna heard this from Rohini Devi, he ran to his mother and she ran to him and they embraced. This is what happened today on Diwali and what is happening eternally in the hearts of those devotees who reside in the Bhav, the love of Vrindavan. And here at Radha Gopinath Temple we are celebrating Govardhan Puja, which technically is tomorrow. We are celebrating at Govardhan Eco Village tomorrow. And you are all invited. It's really a beautiful place. Please come. But I guess I should start the lecture now. <laughs> I will speak briefly on Govardhan Puja and speak perhaps more elaborately tomorrow. So in Srimad Sh Bhagavatam, Shukadeva Goswami tells the story of the Brahmins who were performing their yajna. They were performing their yajna to please the devatas, the demigods, for material prosperity. And Krishna sent his little friends there to get some food. But they did not. They're Brahmins who are gurus, who are pundits. These little cowherd boys, they were not relevant, considering that they were performing these very high-level Vedic yajnas. So Krishna told the cowherd boys, go to their wives. And the Brahmins' wives, when they heard that Krishna was hungry, their hearts melted. They never saw Krishna before. But when they would go to get fruits and flowers from the marketplace, they would hear the gopis talk about Krishna. And just by hearing about Krishna, hearing devotees chant the glories of Krishna, Shravanam, they fell in love with Krishna. And whenever to, together, Kirtanam, they would just speak about Krishna and sing about Krishna. They loved Krishna. So they brought the best food and came to that place in the forest to provide everything for Krishna. They surrendered, like the gopis were to surrender at the Ras Lila. In a similar way, the Brahmins' wives, the Yajnapatnis, they abandoned all varieties of religion. Sarva dharman parityasya mame kam sharanam to please Krishna. Just after that, Krishna saw in close to that place that Nanda Maharaj and Upananda, Abhinandan, Nandan, Sunandan, the leading cowherd men, they were arranging yajnas to be performed also with Vedic Brahmins. Krishna approached Nanda Maharaj. At this time, he was seven years old. Little seven-year-old Gopal, with very sweet voice, he asked his father, so innocent, please tell me, what are you doing? What is this yajna? Why are you doing it? What is the purpose of this? Who are you doing it for? And how are you going to execute it? 
please tell me. He said, even though I'm a little boy, and this may seem, because a yagya is a very technical, high-level Vedic sacrifice. He said, even though I'm a little boy, still, you should tell me. You should not keep secrets from well-wishers. You should only keep secrets from enemies. So please tell me everything. Nanda Maharaj explained that in our community, our livelihood is taking care of cows and agriculture, growing crops. For us to do this, we are dependent on good rains. And the presiding demigod over the rain the king of heaven is Indra. So this is a tradition that we have followed for generations upon generations. Is every year at this time we perform Indra Puja to satisfy Indra, who will send clouds and rains, and we will be prosperous. Krishna is in the heart of all living beings. And we should carefully know that means he's in my heart and he's in your heart. Sometimes we talk philosophy that Krishna is in the heart of every living being, but we're not really willing to recognize that means he's also in my heart, because I'm a living being too. He's in everyone's heart. He sees everything you do. He hears everything you say. He feels everything you th think. He feels everything you feel. We don't know that much about, each o about ourselves, but Krishna knows everything about everyone. As a soul, a jivatma, Krishna knows not only everything you've ever felt, thought, spoke, or did in this life, but in every one of your previous lives. And what's even more profound is he never forgets a single detail. Hare Krishna. So Krishna is always the well-wisher of his devotees. And he knows that the true purpose of bhakti is to awaken our love for him. That's the only thing that could satisfy our heart. And the devatas, the demigods, are Krishna's devotees who are entrusted with incredibly um, influential responsibilities. Indra is the king of the Swarga Loka and the rains. But being a king of heaven with incredible beauty, incredible power and wealth, and every type of sense gratification, limitlessly more than we can even imagine on this little earth planet. He became arrogant. He became proud. In the Bible it is said, pride cometh before the fall. When we have arrogance, we're already fallen. Everything else is just a detail that will take place. So he was arrogant. And Krishna, he wanted to cure him. It's like we have doctors from Bhaktivedanta Hospital I'm seeing assembled here today. We have our operation theaters. You get some anesthesia and then surgery. And sometimes surgery, they have to cut you open. There's 
sometimes they cut your heart open. <laughs> and to get to your heart, they have to cut your chest open. So that surgery is meant ultimately to remove something that should be removed and fix what needs to be fixed. So Krishna is the ultimate surgeon. How to fix Indra. For you or me, you know, if we start getting arrogant, somebody's just going to tell you, just shut up. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> and we think, hmm. You know, if you're living in Brahmacharya Ashram, somebody's going to crush your arrogance. If you're living in Grihastha Ashram, you know, the purpose of a wife and the purpose of a husband and the purpose of having children and in-laws and grandchildren is they're going to, they're meant to crush your ego. <laughs> So instead of fighting it, just surrender and be happy. <laughs> but when you're injured, who's going to crush your ego? You know, every now and then, Hiranyakashipu or somebody like that. But Krishna saw there was arrogance. So he made a very special plan. And he told Nanda Maharaj, his little child talk, very sweet, talkative. He said, actually, there's no need to worship Indra because whatever we're receiving in this world, whether it's good or bad, it's all reactions to our previous karma. Every time we say something, every time we do something, we're sowing the seeds of karma for the future. So within this human life that we have, everything is coming by karma. If we do good, we're going to get good, and if we do bad, we're going to get bad. If we cause others pain, we're going to suffer. If we do good to others, we're going to prosper. So we're good people. And according to our karma, we have a special swabhava. We all have a conditioned nature. That conditioned nature is very strong. And it practically forces us to act in certain ways. It's just the way we are. So the whole world is going around because of this. We're getting reactions to our karma. We have our nature, and that causes us to react to certain situations in a certain way. And there are three modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, sattva guna, raja guna, tama guna. And everything in this creation is under the influence of these three modes of nature. Clouds are created by the mode of passion and they pour rain. If we have good karma, if because of our good nature, we're doing our duties properly, then Indra, who's a demigod, he just has to supply what our karma is. is. Even, if, even the Supreme Lord just supplies according to our karma according to the modes of nature, and according to our nature. Look, what yagyas are the oceans doing? And yet, and they don't even need water. And there's torrents of rain falling in the ocean. And the rocks and the mountains. They're just inanimate beings. They're not doing yagyas. And there's just as much water falling on them as, as here. So Indra's 
just bound according to the modes of nature and according to people's karmas just to provide. So why should we offer this puja to Indra? We don't need Indra. We don't need Indra at all. If we perform our duties properly, everything will be auspicious. And Krishna explained a little of the Varnashram system. The duty of Brahmins is to study the Vedas, to perform yajnas, and to teach others. The duties of Kshatriyas are to protect all living beings and to protect the earth and to administrate. The duty of Vaishyas is farming, agriculture, commerce, protecting cows, and banking. And the duty of the Shudras is to serve, to serve others and assist in that way. Say so we are Vaishyas. And our particular livelihood is protecting the cows. And the cows require grass. Govardhan Hill is providing the best grass. And the Brahmins, they are providing the direction and insight for all of us. So we should worship the cows, the Brahmins, and Govardhan Hill. Dear Father, let us have Govardhan Puja. Take everything that you have arranged for Indra Puja, which is very, very elaborate, and use it all to worship Govardhan Hill. And the Maharaj said, well, why don't we do Indra Puja first? It's traditional, it's our, all our forefathers have done, and then we can do this Govardhan Puja later. Krishna said, no, no, forget Indra, just take everything and give it to them. <laughs> Krishna did not convince Nanda philosophically. Krishna spoke all these words just to completely attract his heart. Ultimately, Nanda Maharaj and everyone in Vrindavan, they only had one wish, to make Krishna happy. Krishna, if it makes you happy to take all this and take the risk of making Indra angry and worshipping a mountain, then we will do. And Krishna gave instructions. He said, take all the milk products we have in the whole of Brajbhumi, the ghee, the yogurt, the milk, and make wonderful milk sweets and other milk preparations, and take all the grains, and let's make mountains of boga to offer Giriraj Govardhan, who is the king of all mountains. So we should take cakes and rice and make lakes of liquids, subjis, vegetables, mountains and mountains and mountains. And after we make these, this anakuta, we should have the Brahmins perform their yagyas. And then we should offer the anakuta to, to Govardhan then feed the Brahmins, then feed the, the bridge bhasis, then feed everyone, the monkeys and the dogs, everyone, sumptuously. And then we will all do parikrama of circumambulating Govardhan Hill. Because after all, Govardhan is our best friend. So this was a great celebration. Nanda Maharaj exactly followed everything Krishna prescribed. They made mountains and mountains. The mountain of rice was covered with so much ghee, it was glistening in the sun. The Anakuta was, uh, actually there was, 
acres and acres of mountains of food. Oh God. It's huge quantity, un unbelievable quantities. It was so beautiful. And meanwhile, the Brahmins, as they were preparing, they were performing their sacrifices and chanting Vedic hymns and mantras. And Nanda Maharaj arranged, after it was all done, for everyone to be fed wonderfully. Everyone. Then all the Brajabhasis had their best clothes on. They were singing beautiful songs. At a certain point, actually, after they, before they fed everyone, I'm sorry, as the mountains of food were there, Krishna, just to show the world forever that he's none different than Govardhan Hill, he personally manifested himself on top of Govardhan. What an amazing sight for everyone. Gopal revealed this gigantic form. And he was walking on Govardhan Hill. He was, he was as big as the mountain. He was not different than the mountain. And Krishna looked up and he said to the bridge bossies, just see, Govardhan is so pleased by all of our service that he's manifesting a personal form just for us. And just see with his gigantic, incredible arms and hands, he's eating all the food that we made. And Govardhan was reaching miles and Krishna said, his mouth is enormous, but yet he's so beautiful with lotus-like eyes. <laughs> and Govardhan ate all the Anakuta. And then again manifested it as Mahaprasad. For more details, come tomorrow. <laughs> And then they fed everyone the Mahaprasad. Krishna and, the go and all the go and all the Krishna bowed down before the magnificent, enormous form of Giriraj. Then, with their best clothes on, they circumambulated Govardhan Hill, beginning the tradition. A tradition which is one of the most cherished forms of worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Even five millenniums later. The young Gopas, they had the, their cows and their calves and they were herding them around in the front of the Parikrama, there were musicians playing beautiful instruments, traditional instruments. There was dancers dancing. All the cows, 900,000 cows, and then there's other people's cows. They had their, each cow, their horns were plated with gold. They had silken sheets with jewels over their backs. The cows were dancing, eating the freshest, nicest grasses. Everyone was so happy. The Brahmins were chanting mantras. The cowherd boars were singing, dancing, and making jokes with Krishna. The elder gopis were riding on ox-driven carts, chariots, and this way it was the most festive,
joyful celebration of circumambulating Govardhana. And after everything was done, they gave in charity to the Brahmins who performed their work, their seva. And all the Brijabhasis were in so much happiness. It is described that the Jivatma is infin infinitesimally small, but in relation with Krishna, that Jivatma is experiencing unlimited, ever-expanding happiness. The festival was the most beautiful festival they had ever celebrated, and they all went to their homes just talking about Krishna. How wonderful is Krishna? But there was one person who was not happy. Indra was furious. He was insulted. It was really an insult. It's one thing to take something that you expect every year, for generations, every year, for hundreds of years perhaps, the Brijabhasis would perform that ceremony on that day for Indra. And he's expecting it. Now if they did it for another demigod or some rishi or sage, it's a little bit of an insult. But to offer it to a hill? <laughs> he was furious. Krishna tells in Gita, Dhyayato Vishayam Bhungsang, that when you have all these material desires, karma, when they're not fulfilled, when you don't get what you're expecting, it becomes Kroda from Kama to Kroda. We become angry. And the nature of that angry anger is it eventually bewilders our intelligence. And we act in such ways that we're just blinded by that anger. anger Andrew was so infuriated. This is the arrogance. When, you, when, you're, when your ego is insulted, it becomes so frustrated. You feel such pain. Andra was in misery. He called the clouds of devastation, samvartaka. These are the clouds that actually cover the entire planet Earth at the time of a pralaya. They have the power t to make the int this whole planet a massive ocean. They destroy everything. He called those clouds and told them to specifically destroy Vrindavan. He said, these bridge bosses headed by Nanda Maharaj, because of their prosperity, because of their opulences, they have become so puffed up that they think that they could insult me. The world is a mirror of our own consciousness. Because he was so puffed up, he was thinking that they're arrogant because he had so much opulence and wealth. He was thinking they must be like him. That's human psychology. We impose our own state of consciousness on others. Because they have so much, they think that they have the power to insult me. They must be destroyed. I will teach them a lesson. Go to Vrindavan and destroy everything. Teach them this lesson. Instead of worshiping me, they're listening to this talkative little child, Krishna. 
Samvartaka clouds began to form over Vrindavan. Soon the entire sky became totally black. Thunder, rumbling. <laughs> and lightning <laughs> crisscrossing everywhere. The Brijabhasis were seeing this. They never saw such lightning, thunderstorms, thunder, black clouds, then torrents of rain. How was it raining? Srimad Bhagavatam explains it was coming down like columns. Kavi Karnapur explains the rain was like from this, imagine this, a river that's so over flooded that's behind a dam and that river has such a massive quantity of water it, it breaks the dam and flows It was with that force that water was coming from the sky. It was like a massive river that was ferociously just breaking a dam and pouring down at high speed. It was flooding everything. And there was massive winds. It became freezing cold. Sometimes the rain was like the various trunks of a banyan tree just pouring down. Then the rain became hail, large balls of ice crushing down. The Prajabhasis were freezing cold. Cows trying to protect their calves were standing over them, covering their little calves' heads with with the skin that is under their necks. The cows are crying and trembling in the cold and the calves, fearful as anything, are crying under their mother's protection. And the bulls are massive pieces of ice cr cracking against their back and and columns of water falling upon them. They're looking at the black sky roaring. <laughs> but what could they do? The Brijabhasi saw there was no difference between the high places and the low places. Everything was, in, was instantly being completely flooded with water. It was millions of times more than the worst flood Bombay has ever seen. It was devastation. They turned to Krishna. The cowherd man, the gopis, they turn Krishna, Krishna, Mahabhaga. Oh, Krishna. Why did they turn to Krishna? Nanda Maharaj, she remembered Gargamuni said that Krishna will always give protection because he's like Narayan. <laughs> so, even though they never thought of Krishna as God, somehow or other they always felt Krishna would protect them. Krishna, look, see how the cows are suffering. And see how all of us are suffering. Indra's angry, please protect us. And Krishna was thinking, because of Indra's false ego, he's so infuriated, he's trying to destroy my whole village and my whole family. I will teach him a good lesson. And then by Krishna's yoga maya potency, there was a pathway where there was no rain at all. And Krishna went to Govardhan Hill. 
and as effortless as a child lifts a mushroom over his head, Krishna lifted the Govardhan hill. As he lifted Giriraj, the king of the mountains, it made a tumultuous sound that reverberated everywhere. Just think, this is an enormous mountain being lifted off the ground. Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill with one hand and with the tip of the little finger of his left hand he held it above his head and smiled. Another analogy used in Srimad Bhagavatam is Krishna lifted the hill as effortless as a gigantic elephant lifts a lotus flower. Krishna completely peaceful, smiling. He invited the Brijabhasis that look, Giriraj is so happy that we worshipped him so nicely and gave him that anakuta, so much nice food, and we did pujas for him, and we were singing for him and dancing for him. He's so happy. Now he's giving us shelter from Indra's reign. He's become an umbrella. Please come and bring all of your animals and bring all of your, your valuables and let us be together under Govardhan Hill. All the Brijabhasis came. And what they saw was incredible. The valley under Govardhan Hill, it wasn't like just a, a hole. <laughs> it was all green with auspicious plants and flowers and gardens. <laughs> and crops growing. There were beautiful lakes with lotuses under the hill. And there was dirt falling from the ends of the hill to make a boundary so no water could get in. And Sudarshan Chakra wanted to do seva for Krishna, so he was and drying up the water before it hit the ground, so nothing came under the hill. Now all the Brijabhasis, all the cows, the gopas, the gopis, everyone, the goats, the buffaloes, the birds, they were seeing the beautiful darshan of Gididari. Krishna, working in a threefold bending form with his hand raised, lifting Govardhan Hill and smiling upon them. As Indra was throwing the greatest of thunderbolts upon Govardhan Hill, and massive rivers of rain were f f smashing it, and hurricane-like winds were blowing upon it, Govardhan, who's a person. Krishna manifested himself as the person of Govardhan. Didn't feel the slightest inconvenience because he was touched by Krishna's finger. Just that experience of being touched by Krishna made him completely transcendental to anything Indra did. And not only that, everyone on Govardhan because they were, uh, Govardhan was connected to Krishna's finger, like parampara, everyone who was being touched by Govardhan. They were transcendental. The birds were singing, the deers, they were just walking around completely aloof from Indra, very happy. There were lions, they just looked up and roared at Indra. And, <laughs> the kind of roar like Indra, who are you? <laughs> who needs you? We have Giridari. Indra was being insulted very severely. Above the hill, 
there was um, there was lightning, there was dark clouds, and there was downpour of rain. And below the hill was a wonderful festival of love. There was the lightning of the gopis' glances. And Krishna, who was like a dark cloud, and his love for his devotees was like an infinite rainstorm flooding everyone's heart. All the Brijabhasis for seven days and seven nights gazed upon Krishna. And every living, every being there, whoever they were, for the whole seven days and seven nights, they all felt that Krishna's gazing upon me. That is Krishna. Now ordinarily, Krishna would meet gopis at night. He would be, but then during the day he would be with his friends. But then at the night, at night the friends would feel separation from him. In the day, the parents would feel separation from him. But for these seven days and seven nights, everyone equally was continuously with Krishna. And the beauty of that form of Giridhari completely enchanted their hearts. Raktak and the other servants of Krishna in Dasyaras, they were rendering all kinds of services to him while he was lifting Govardhan here. And the gopas and sakyaras in their friendly relationship were joking with Krishna and talking with Krishna and they were just making each other so happy. And the younger gopis, Shiradha and her associates, they were just close by, constantly gazing upon Krishna. And Krishna would gaze upon them. And through his glance, he, he personally entered deep, deep, deep into the core of their hearts and embraced them and they embraced him. All of the various relationships were being fully reciprocated between Krishna and his devotees. And Vatsalyaras, Yashodamaya was always worried about Krishna. In one place she prays, Gopal, why are you so impudent and mischievous that you insulted Indra? <laughs> now look, there's these great storms and with your little, with your tiny little soft hand, you're holding this hard, gigantic mountain it must hurt. You must be tired. You showed him I prayed that Giriraj, if you really can fulfill everyone's desire like Krishna said you can, then fulfill this one desire of mine. Please, to Krishna's soft little hand, be as soft as freshly churned butter and be so light that you're practically floating in the sky. And Krishna told you, showed him, I, that actually, that it is not me, it is Govardhan. I'm just an instrument. Govardhan is, because he's so pleased with our puja to him, he's giving us shelter and he's so light, he's just floating and I'm just putting my hand like this. Yashodamai said, if that's true, then separate your hand from him and let us see him float in the sky. Yashodamai was constantly trying to bring Krishna food to eat, <laughs> to put in his mouth. 
And as Krishna was holding Govardhan Hill with his left hand, with his right hand, he took his flute from his belt and put it to his lips and played beautiful songs of love. When Krishna played his flute, it was so sweet. Madhu Mangal, he said, Krishna, please don't play your flute. We love to hear the music of your flute, but we don't want you to play your flute. Because we have seen the, we, we have seen the effect of your flute. When you play your flute, it puts everyone in transcendental ecstasy. And we've already seen how Giriraj Govardhan is a person. Hearing the sound of your flute, he's going to become ecstatic and he might fall from your hand and crush everyone. <laughs> and we've also seen the effect of your flute that, that rocks and mountains melt into liquid and rivers and lakes turn as hard as stone. So this flute playing, if, Christ, if Govardhan becomes liquid, then that will be even more devastating than Indra's reigns. Another Gopa, he said to Madhu Mangal, that Govardhan is very sober. He's very patient. Even in his great ecstasies, he will protect us. Krishna played his beautiful flute. And as he was playing, he was glancing upon each devotee, and every devotee was glancing upon him. Each cow was feeling Krishna personally showering his love upon them. Everyone. And when Sri Radha glanced in a special way upon Krishna. It affect the beauty. Because Sri Radha's body, it's described by Ramananda Rai in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Her clothes, her jewels, every limb and every feature of her body, it is Satchidananda, it is spiritual, it is a manifestation of her love for Krishna. Every part of Sri Radha is an aspect of her ecstatic, infinite, ever-increasing love for Krishna. So upon seeing Sri Radha and the beauty of her glance, Krishna began to tremble. When that trembling, Govardhan Hill began to shake. And the elder cowherd men picked up their sticks Krishna's getting tired. And they all put their sticks under Govardhan Hill and they were thinking that they were holding it up. Madhu Mangal was... He was chastising them. He said, it's only because he's experiencing the ecstasy of his love for Radha you think that you are holding up Govardhan Hill? My friend Krishna is the younger brother of Balaram, who has infinite strength. You are just uselessly scratching the bottom of the hill with your sticks. <laughs> Krishna told Madhu Mangal, don't say these things about the gopas. They are doing this out of their love for me. They are doing this to serve me, to assist me. Let them do. In this way, for seven days and seven nights, there was a continuous shower of love between Krishna and each of the Brijbhasis. And meanwhile, the Sambhartaka, Sambhartaka clouds, they became so exhausted they went back to Indra and said, we surrendered to you, but now we have to surrender. We can, we can no longer continue. And Indra was even more angry. 
and on Airavata, his elephant, he took every type of storm he could to try to blow Giriraj off Krishna's little finger. But in those seven days and seven nights with the worst hurricanes ever seen, the greatest rainstorms, because Govardhan was so pleased with Krishna's mercy upon him in the form of Haridas Bharaya, a servant of Krishna. In that whole seven days, Indra did not have the power to separate a single leaf from the tens, hundreds, and thousands of trees on Govardhan. Did not have the power with all those winds to uproot a single blade of grass out of the hundreds and millions and trillions of blades of grass. He did not even have the power to move a single grain of dust. When Krishna wants to humble his devotee, it is thorough. Indra realized that this talkative little Gopal is Bhagavan. He's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's the cause of all causes. He's the source of everything. And I tried to kill him. <laughs> I tried to destroy everything dear to him and everyone. All the storm stopped. And the sun came out. And Krishna blissfully told all the Brijabhasis, now the day is very pleasant. You can all go back to your homes. They didn't want to go. Constant vision of the form of Giridhari. They could stand and look at him for all eternity and only have ever increasing happiness. But as their seva to Krishna, they all left the hill. And when they were all gone, Gopal effortlessly and so gracefully placed Govardhan Hill on the ground just the way it was before. And then he, after everyone went home, he went to a secluded place with some of his friends. in one of the forests near Govardhan. Indra was feeling so ashamed. He approached his guru, Brihaspati. Brihaspati told him, Indra, you are a fool. Krishna's the supreme object of all love. He's the creator, maintainer, and destroyer of everything that exists. He has descended from the spiritual world to give mercy to all living beings. And you try to destroy him and his village? You should go to Lord Brahma, the original guru of the entire universe. Indra went to Brahma. Brahma told Indra, you are a fool. <laughs> what have you done? You can't approach Krishna directly after your offenses. He will only forgive you if someone who loves him appeals on your behalf. you should approach Suravi. There's a Goloka within this material world, which is the planet of the cows in the heavenly worlds, just as there's a Goloka in the spiritual world beyond this world. Indra went to Suravi and begged her, please on my behalf, 
approached Krishna. So Rabi was so happy. Here is Indra, the king of the heavens, with the mother cow. He surrendered to the hooves, the lotus hooves of the cow. They approached. And Krishna just, because now that Indra was humbled and seeking rectification, Krishna did not want to humiliate him anymore. Krishna wanted to spare him any further humiliation. He only humiliated Indra just to get him to the point where he was willing to surrender. But after he surrendered, Krishna wanted to make everything as easy as possible. So Krishna alone went to a secluded place. The place is today called Surabhi Kund. And there Surabhi approached Krishna. And she offered beautiful prayers. It said, Indra, he's come to surrender his heart to you. And it was only then that Krishna looked toward Indra. Indra offered prayers and ultimately like Nala Kuvera and Manigriva, he was grateful. Yasyaha Managrenami Harisheta Dhanam Shanai. Krishna tells, when I want to give my highest mercy to a devotee, I take away everything they have. Indra prayed that I have done so wrong but you are so merciful that you've done all this just to protect me and smash my pride. Krishna forgave him. Told Indra to go back and perform his service. Sorabi, she said, because you have done so, you have given such pleasure to all my children, the cows. I want to give you a, I want to give you an abhishek with my milk. And at the place called Govindakun, there was a great abhishek. First Surabi bathed Krishna with her own milk, her limitless milk. Indra with Airavata got brought from the heavenly worlds. the water of the Mandakini Ganga and bathed Krishna. And the wives of the sages and the various devatas and devas, they all came to perform this beautiful Abhishek. And it was there that Indra gave, gave Krishna the name Govinda. So Rabi said, Oh Govinda, you are the you are our Indra. You are our Lord forever. Govardhan Puja is the most beautiful celebrated festival in all of the world for the devotees of Krishna. All of you are looking at this incredible mountain, this Anakuta of Prasad. And you must be thinking, why is this lecture so long? <laughs> and I have to confess, when I'm looking at this mountain of Prasad, I'm, even I'm thinking like that. <laughs> But Srila Prabhupada, as our Acharya, in his last days, he wanted to do Parikrama of Gopardhan Hill, which is a beautiful story. Madhavendra Puri discovered Gopal Srinathji at Gopardhan Hill. 
Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would not even walk upon Govardhan Hill because he saw it as the very body of Lord Krishna. Raghunath Das Goswami, the dear most associate of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Lord Chaitanya showed his supreme mercy upon him by giving him a single Govardhan Shila to worship. Raghunath Das Goswami lived at Sri Radha Kund near Govardhan Hill. Rupa Goswami, one of his Bhajan Kutirs was at Govardhan, Jiva Goswami. Sri Padvala Bacharya, he had his Baitak at Govardhan Hill. Gopal Bhatta Goswami, Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, all the six Goswamis had their places of worship at Govardhan Hill. And Sanatana Goswami at the Manasi Ganga, Chakaleshwar Mahadev. He lived for many years and wrote so many of his beautiful books at Govardhan Hill. And ultimately, he gave up his life at Govardhan Hill. These great personalities, while they were at Govardhan, they would do the full parikrama every single day. Rupa Goswami writes, that in this entire creation, the earth planet is the best because the Lord comes here in so many manifestations. And in the earth planet, Bharat, India is most holy. And within India, Matara Mandala is most holy because that's where Krishna appears and performs his Leela. And the forest of Vrindavan is most holy because Krishna performs his most intimate Leela. And in the forest of Vrindavan, the holiest of all holy places is Govardhan Hill, where the most confidential sweet pastimes between the Gopas and the Gopis of Krishna are eternally taking place. And at Govardhan Hill, Radha Kund is holiest. Tomorrow at Govardhan Eco Village, we will discuss some of the history of Govardhan Hill, if you'd like to come. And also, like in our yatras, we're going to be having in a field little stoves where hundreds of people could cook preparations for the Anakut Kiriraj. And now that I'm about to finish the class, Goranga Prabhu will give you an official invitation. <laughs> These beautiful festivals that we celebrate at Radha Gopinath Temple by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada are great blessings. They provide the opportunity for us to, to be together and focus our attention on what's truly the most important thing in life, to become attracted to Krishna. Vrindavan are the pastimes of the Lord that he manifests once in a day in Brahma. Wherever we remember them, wherever we sing about them, wherever we speak about them, we actually can enter into Vrindavan. When we share Vrindavan, Tatra Tishtami Narada Yatra Gayanti Mad Bhakta, we can actually enter the bhava of Vrindavan and become attached to Krishna, become attracted to Krishna. 
to our sincerity, our humility, our deep desire to serve as the servant of the servant, and our deep faith in the holy names and the Vaishnavas. We could realize Vrindavan within our own hearts. Thank you very much.